Before I begin the formal introduction, I'd like to tell you that we are web streaming this lecture today. And so f during our question and answer period, it will be necessary if you do have a question to come to the microphone so that we'll be able to catch your questions in the web stream. Thank you very much. Go ahead and come in. There are many seats available down front. I always like to say it's a little bit like church. Everyone wants to sit in the back and get out fast. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine at the West Virginia University College of Law. This lecture series is made possible through the generosity of Dr. Thomas S. Clark, his wife, Jean Clark, and their two sons, Chad and Stuart. Established in 1998, the Law and Medicine Lecture is one of 10 created by the Clarks across the university in various disciplines. This one honors their very close friend, John W. Fisher, on becoming the 15th Dean of the College of Law. The Clarks are loyal mountaineers. Dr. Clark earned his medical degree at WVU in 1975, became the medical director of Mylan Pharmaceuticals and the former CEO and owner of Clinical Pharmacologic Research Incorporated. His wife, Jean Clark, completed her BA at WVU in 1967 received a Master's of Education in 1974, and has served the University Foundation on its Board of Directors. John Fisher, the William J. Mayer Junior Dean Emeritus, is the quintessential loyal mountaineer, earning his BA and JD at WVU and serving the university over many years and many capacities. In keeping with today's topic, the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals refers to Dean Fisher as the state's foremost authority in the field of property law. And those who have had the privilege of being his students and his colleagues know that to be true. On behalf of the College of Law community, our thanks go out to the Clarks for their recognition of the important and beneficial connections between law and medicine. Today's speaker represents the best of these beneficial connections. Michelle Goodwin is the Everett Fraser Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota, holding joint appointments at the University of Medical, Minnesota Medical School and the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. She has served as a visiting professor at the University of Chicago, a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, she was honored with a distinguished visiting professorship at Griffith University in Australia. And prior to law teaching, she was a Gilder Lehrman postdoctoral fellow at Yale University. Professor Goodwin is a scholar's scholar, the author of many books, including Black Markets, The Sly, Supply and Demand of Human Body Parts by Cambridge University Press. She is published in many prestigious journals including the New England Journal of Medicine and Nature. She is also a public scholar whose commentaries are often seen in the LA Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Forbes. Today, Professor Goodwin in her lecture, Who Owns Your Body? A Conversation About Medical Research and the Body Bazaar, discusses the troubling contemporary domains of medical research where the body is sometimes mined for its biological riches without the patient's or family's knowledge. She will discuss patients' legal rights and answer controversial questions surrounding the ownership of the human body and whether current legal frameworks are sufficient in providing relief for exploited patients. Please join me in welcoming Professor Goodwin to the WVU College of Law. Thank you so much. That 
such an incredibly generous introduction. Thank you very much, Dean McConnell. Uh, I have heard that you are the miracle here and that you truly make things happen, and I can say that, that I see that. I confirm that just in my brief time here. I also want to thank uh, Dean Ann Lafaso for also helping me in this process and, and coming here, and Margaret O'Bush, who's been behind the scenes, and she's probably not in this room, but she's been absolutely terrific. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be presenting this lecture in honor of the former Dean, uh, Professor Fisher. So this talk today includes some slides, which I hope that uh, you can see, and I wanted to frame it as a conversation because these issues are touchy, and, uh, and besides, I, I just want to talk with you anyway, and I hope that you'll talk with me too through the question and answer period. Now, I frame this talk on the heels of what has become uh, a very interesting uh, book in public discourse. That is the book that deals with the story of Henrietta Lacks. Uh, she was an African-American woman who was a patient at Johns Hopkins Hospital years ago, and it is her cell line which has become known as immortal. It is a cell line that has become incredibly valuable um, over time, there's probably been billions of dollars associated, certainly billions, but how many billions, multiple, multiple billions associated with her cell line because it's her cell line that was used in uh, experiments to uh, create the polio uh, vaccine and so many, I mean, virtually you name what we have tried to conquer in medicine and her story has been a part of it. Only her family never knew about it. So today we'll talk about her story, and then we'll bring this a little bit up to date with talking about other kinds of demands in the human body, particularly organs. And we'll wrap that up by looking at some other discrete areas where there is significant demand for human body that we take for granted, like hair. Me, if I watched the Grammys last night, I know it was on, I, I didn't watch it, but I'm sure there was lots of hair flowing. Uh, and with all of that hair flowing, it, human hair, for sure, much of it, but whether or not it actually grew on the heads of those people who were shaking it is another question altogether. All right, so let's begin. So Henrietta Lacks was born in 1920 and she died in 1951. Uh, and there are almost 11,000 patents that involve her cell line. Uh, her cell lines uh, were the first commercially available cells. All right, so this talk proceeds in three parts. The Lax case in her life and context, a bit about law and order, and then bringing it home to think about principles and values. Okay, a little bit uh, in context. So Henrietta's childhood home was in Virginia, in Clover, Virginia. And she married this man here who happened to be her cousin, and his name was Day Lax, and he actually survived her and died about 10 years ago. Together they created a family where they had five children, Elsie, David, Deborah, uh, Zakira, uh, and uh, he was born uh, Joseph Lax, but he later changed his name. Here's an image of their daughter, Elsie, and the reason why I include her in the slides is that she has a very interesting story that also does not escape the sort of purview of race and class at the time. Now, there, this daughter, it's her eldest daughter, she was born mute um, and deaf, but as a reflection of the times, she was considered dumb. Eventually, in 1955, at the hospital for the Negro Insane, later known as Crownsville, an institution for African Americans, before she dies, there is this photo that's taken of her. And I just wanted to read to you um, how Rebecca Skloot describes the image of this beautiful girl. As you know, we'd all see she's absolutely beautiful. But what happens to an African American child in the 1950s who's just simply deaf and who's never provided services to help her learn how to sign and so forth. Her hair is frizzy with thick mats. Her once beautiful eyes bulge from her head, slightly bruised and almost swollen shut. She stares somewhere just below the camera, crying, her face misshapen and barely recognizable. Her nostrils flamed and ringed with mucus. Her lips swollen to nearly twice their normal size are surrounded by a deep, dark ring of chapped skin. Her tongue is thick and protrudes from her mouth. 
She appears to be screaming. Her head is twisted unnaturally to the left, her chin raised and held by a pair of large white hands. Now, she dies at 16. So you sort of contextualize what life is like um, at that time, the 1950s, for African Americans who are institutionalized. This is the sort of backdrop of this family. So here's how the story unfolds. In the late, 19, uh, in the late January of 1951, um, we have Henrietta Lacks who goes into Johns Hopkins uh, complaining of a lump in her abdomen. And she's treated with radiation. Uh, and interestingly, how she's treated with radiation is that tubes of radium are actually sewn into her womb. And during her radiation treatment for the tumor, part of her cervix is harvested. Uh, enough tissue was collected so that there was a, quote, healthy portion retrieved uh, and another that was uh, from her cancer that was retrieved. Uh, and this was done without her consent. So she was under, uh, and at the time, doctors at Johns Hopkins were trying to collect as many samples as they possibly could. Um, this uh, guy here, Dr. George uh, Gee, he was very concerned about um, trying to find an immortal cell line. For a lot of people, they thought it was just a fantasy, right? Here he's after this immortal cell line, and he's experimenting with chickens, and he's experimenting with all sorts of, of people in media, and he's asking his friends, just give me samples, give me samples. And so uh, samples are collected uh, from, uh, from Ms. Lex. Now, after her treatment, she's diagnosed as fine. And it's written on her chart that there is no evidence uh, that there's any recurrence of cancer. Two weeks later, she, re she returns, though, complaining of more pain, and she's sent home with a catheter. She says, I'm having trouble with urination. I'm still in severe pain, so they send her home with a catheter. She returns again saying, I'm still in pain. I'm having a difficult time. Uh, and there, a lump in her pelvis is discovered. The cells from her cervix were given uh, to Dr. Gee. He was a carpenter turned doctor who had endeavored for a number of years, as I said, to kind of master and, and find an immortal cell line. Now here's how the story unfolds of a, a tale of two different wards. And Mary Kubitschek is interesting for this story because the HeLa cell line is known by doctors all around the world and named for it, but no one ever knew who was connected to it. No one. No one knew that it was this black woman, Henrietta Lacks. They only knew HeLa cell line. Well, she named it HeLa cell line. And so she was a person who worked in the lab and in come these tissues. And she sees the name and she just scribbles down HeLa cell line. And lo and behold, um, the power of all of that. But here's the tale of the two different wards um, at Johns Hopkins and where race and gender mattered um, quite a bit. So she names the HeLa cell lines. Demand for the cell lines uh, take off. Here's an image of the cell lines with a little bit of dye in them. They actually look quite pretty. Uh, as it turned out, they just kept multiplying over and over again quite rapidly. Uh, she was absolutely shocked by that. She called it to his attention. She said, they're just proliferating all, all these cells. They won't die. So here we see demand taking off. The whole lab re, re sort of situates itself to deal with the uh, HeLa cell line. In the meantime, Henrietta dies, right? So there's, there's Henrietta on one hand who's complaining of pain and it's questionable whether or not she's getting the type of treatment that she would deserve, certainly not the kind of pain treatment which uh, she was asking for. And there are medical studies that show that um, that African Americans tend to not get the quality of pain relief that, um, that would otherwise be suitable uh, for their condition. So she dies. It's an image of her death certificate here. And what was her story? So the cancer had metastasized. She was in severe pain. She had had fevers. Her pain was uh, intense. Uh, on her medical chart, it was noted that Henrietta is a miserable specimen <laughs> because she's always complaining of pain. Um, doctors said, as far as they could see, they were doing all that could be done. But was there more that actually could have been done? And here I want to just put the story of Johns Hopkins and race in context. And in particular, as Ann and I were talking about this talk and the fact that this is Black History Month, thought that it might be actually interesting to revisit 
race and medicine. So what's happening at Johns Hopkins at the same time that we have Henrietta Lacks' story happening in one part of the hospital? Well, the other part of the story here is uh, Vivian Thomas. And some of you may have seen the movie Blue Babies or know about Blue Babies at all. Well, his story is very interesting. He's an African-American surgical technician who developed the procedure used to treat Blue Baby Syndrome in the 1940s. He was an assistant to the surgeon Alfred Blaylock, and the story there is very fascinating because while Blaylock was at uh, Vanderbilt, he discovers this janitor has very dexterous fingers, and this janitor Vivian, who had always wanted to go to medical school but couldn't afford to do so. As it turns out, he knows how to design and create uh, medical instruments. And it turns out that he knows how to do surgery. So Blaylock gets him going, doing surgeries on dogs, and then doing, um, sur helping him on, with surgeries on babies. And Vivian is so instrumental to Blaylock that when Johns Hopkins calls Blaylock and says, we want to recruit you, he says, I have to come with my janitor, right? Because after all, this guy's just a janitor. But this janitor is actually teaching him how to perform certain surgeries. And so there we have Blaylock there uh, and news reports about uh, Blaylock saving babies. Very interesting side story about Thomas is that he actually becomes – the trainer, all the surgeons have to go through him at Johns Hopkins. So what's very interesting is that he's paid nearly the salary of a janitor. He's training all the surgeons at Johns Hopkins. He's perfected the tools to do this kind of surgery. And it's very interesting as you read the story of Blaylock and Thomas is that Blaylock at times when he wanted to have a dinner party at his house would have Thomas come and serve. So this very interesting kind of two-world story happening at Johns Hopkins uh, during that time. Right. The other part of the story of Johns Hopkins that I want to complicate for us just a little bit here, too, happens to, be, uh, happens to deal with the Tuskegee experiments because physicians at Johns Hopkins were a part of one of the United States' longest-running and most notorious uh, studies that involved illiterate men who were not – some people think that they were that, – that they were um, – that, that we somehow implanted syphilis in them. That wasn't the case. They had syphilis. But – what happened is that they were told that they were being treated for their syphilis and that they were being provided antibiotics. Uh, researchers at Johns Hopkins were involved in it, and the study was actually conducted through what is now our Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and these men were just given sugar pills. Uh, and the study went on for 40 years, even after we had a, discovered that penicillin could cure syphilis. They infected their wives, and they had children born uh, affected by syphilis. And each year, as you can see what I have right here, let's see, this is pointer. Oh, oh, my goodness. It's, okay. That's not a pointer, clearly. But anyway, over here on the right is a letter. So every year they'd get a letter that says, congratulations. Great job for being in this study, never knowing uh, that this study was really about seeing their bodies hasten and waste away from syphilis so that their bodies could be autopsied and study after, studied after death. All right. Uh, after 40 years, the study finally shuts down, but Johns Hopkins is involved in that. And then one other piece of the, the puzzle here that's also involved in how we sort of engage with the body and what is ours and how do other people engage with what is ours, and that is uh, researchers at Hopkins. But also I want to be clear to point out that not just Hopkins, University of Pennsylvania Medical School and other top schools across the country involved with studies on prisoners as well, not always informing prisoners about the extent to which their bodies are involved in medical research or what the consequences are of the kinds of experiments that are taking place on their bodies. So here what we have in the picture on the left is a gentleman whose body has been uh, punctuated uh, with a variety of diseases. So each one of those patches represents a different kind of disease that's, um, that's been placed on his skin uh, and various agents injected in purposely into his skin so that the effects can be studied. And then on the right we have Jess Williams who actually sued to receive damages um, and other compensation 
um, monetary compensation for the cancer and skin conditions that plagued him after he left the Holmesburg prison, right? Now, of course, there's the question as to who benefits and who's harmed by the future of technology, by what we do, um, and what we owe to individuals who, um, who provide the um, source of the exper experimentation that we engage in, right? So under what theories of law might we think about um, protecting individuals? Or under what theories of law might we think about who owns the body? And I talked about this with some students yesterday. And it's a question that, that's not settled, right? So we might think that somewhere in the law, in the legislature, that there's an answer, not so much, or that there's an answer necessarily a solid, firm, universal answer in courts. No, not so much. It actually is a very fluid type of a uh, question. Uh, and before I get to this slide, let me just talk a little bit about why it's so fluid here. So many of you have studied the case Moore v. Regents, and you've probably studied it in torts, and you've also probably studied it in property law. And you know it's the story of this guy who has hairy cell leukemia. He lives in Seattle, but his doctors are at the UCLA uh, Medical Hospital. They ask him to come back and forth to UCLA. He believes that they're treating his condition of hairy cell leukemia. And each time that he goes, they want something more from him. They want his spleen. They want his semen. They, you know, they, they, they want uh, his blood. They want plasma over and over again. Eventually, they patent, they develop a patent that's based on his cell line. And Moore sues his doctor. Now, as it turns out, and what Moore did not know, is that his doctor behind the scenes was collaborating uh, and had formed a partnership with a biotech company. And he did not realize that, right? And so when Moore sues, he has 13 causes of action that he sues for. And he loses on all of them, with the exception of one, and that is that the California Supreme Court did find that there was a breach of a fiduciary duty. The doctor should have informed him what they were doing. But on all those other causes of action, he loses. And what the court comes away with is, look, we can't have people owning their body. What is this concept of body ownership? And even though Moore's lawyer said, look, this idea of body ownership is not new. Actually, in old English common law, there was a quasi-property right theory in the body. Why can't we just apply that? But interestingly enough, in Europe, how that develops is more of a responsibility than necessarily a right. And here's how it emerges. Poor people couldn't afford burial plots. They couldn't afford to properly bury their relatives sometimes. And so what do you think they did? Sometimes they shoved them in the fireplace. Sometimes uh, put them in the furnace. And this, of course, creates a terrible stink, quite literally, uh, in neighborhoods. And you have neighbors that then complain and sue a nuisance. It's say, look, you've created a nuisance by the smell of your relative coming out of your chimney. And so as a result, you see this morphing in law that creates what's called a quasi-property right interest in the body, but really it's about a responsibility or a duty to properly uh, uh, to properly bury or cremate uh, a relative. Equally, we've seen differences between circuit courts and also state courts with how to treat issues where family members sues because sues an institution like a hospital or a body bank because a relative's corneas have been non-consensually removed. So we have the Brotherton v. Cleveland case that comes out of the Sixth Circuit some years ago where the court says that, yes, a wife does have a property interest in her husband's corneas. In that case, the husband dies, and without her consent, the hospital removes the corneas and donates them to, um, to an eye bank. And you have other state courts, like in Alabama, right, the Georgia Lyons case, where the court says after parents, a parent, their, their, their baby dies, and they take the baby to the hospital, and without their consent, the baby's corneas are removed and donated uh, to an eye bank. And there you have court saying that, look, you should be grateful. What were you going to do with the corneas anyway? You can't use those corneas, but someone else can. 
ergo no remedy for those individuals, right? So things are a bit split. And we'll talk a little bit about, hopefully in, in, in the Q&A, about how we should think about the human body then, given that courts are, are split. What about if you have a surgery that involves a tendon, right? So you're getting a new sort of implant, tendon-like implant in your body. But it turns out that it's insalubrious, it's unhealthy, and you become sick from that. If you sue the company that manufactured or processed, if you will, because they didn't manufacture it, it's human. They just processed it and put it in a package. If you sue them because they sold a product to you, this human product, that's unhealthy, what cause of action do you do it under? In one of my um, articles, uh, Formalism uh, and Human Body Parts, I talk about cases such as that where courts are actually stuck and courts have said no cause of action because these companies are just like blood banks and blood banks have immunity from litigation, from suit. All right, so what does this mean in modern times, right? So that's some of the history of what's going on. What's really hot today happens to be black markets that are taking place around the world. So here's Dr. Amit Kumar. He's known as Dr. Death. He's an Indian doctor and he's believed to have mastermind an illegal multi-million dollar a year kidney industry uh, in India. Uh, of course, organ selling uh, is illegal in all countries except Iran, but it happens uh, quite a bit in places like Bihar, India, and other regions, uh, in Pakistan, in Brazil. Uh, in fact, in Brazil, there are controversies about kids being plucked off the street who've become part of organ supply, South Africa and other places, right? Here's Dr. Kumar actually being led away. And in part, what drives some of the black market that we see in other countries happens to be our own demand. So while we're trying to figure out what this all means, we're a part of it, right? now. We're bursting at the seams with our transplant wait list. We have huge demand and very low supply, right? And when that happens, it means that people try to find other ways to go about getting what it is that they need. We have more than 100,000 people waiting for organs in the United States on the wait list, and that's actually a kind of false number because we have more people than that that actually need organs, right? But we have a rationing process that takes place uh, before people get into the system and even after people get on into the system. And so when people can't get their organs here in the United States, they go to other markets elsewhere. India is one of the places. Here are men in India who sold their kidneys. And I've traveled all throughout India. I just got back from India a couple weeks ago um, visiting a variety of regions. Quite common that you see in whole communities, right, people with the thick scar because they've sold their kidney on the black market. Right, But here we've got blood cellars. And years ago, Richard Titmuss is a philosopher. He said that there should never be anything other than altruism associated with the human body. But the reality is that we're far from that. Now, there is a national law, the National Organ Transplant Act, that states that there should not be any valuable consideration. And by that, it's been defined anything, we're not just talking about money, we're talking about a cup of coffee, that there should be no valuable consideration associated with an exchange in the human body. But in reality, we know that that happens all the time. It happens with sperm donation, right? As I told a group of students I met with yesterday, the reality is it's students like the ones in this law school that are sought after, smart people, getting graduate degrees, they've demonstrated their capacity to, to work hard, uh, a desire to be educated, the ideal kind of genetic makeup that families want for the person who will become the genetic father of their child. Or like the women who are in this room who are dynamic law students, especially if you're over five foot eight, that's, that's usually a, a desired trait. So we do have markets that are taking place all the time, even though we actually have a national law that said that there should be no valuable consideration involved in the exchange of human body parts, right? So what does this mean then in other contemporary contexts as well? So we might say that, yes, we understand that people need organs and we know that people get knee surgeries and so there are these tendon things that are involved. Those are the kinds of things that we can think about and track. 
But there are other industries that happen sort of behind the scenes. They're sort of very present. If you go to their websites, you'll see their SEC filings. Right? So there are ways of knowing that they're actually very present. They used to have, many of them have taken this down, sort of um, uh, used to, to quote how much value they got out of a human body, right? So CryoLife and other companies like that. This is a mugshot of a person that I think would be hard to miss, right? If he walked in this building, and if he were frequently in and out of this building with a big bag and we heard him sawing literally in rooms next to ours, we take notice. At UCLA, they said they never noticed him, that they never noticed him as he was coming into the medical school several times a week carrying a bag, a bag that contained saws and other accoutrements used to, uh, to dissect human bodies. And they said, well, they never noticed him when he would leave out with that big bag full of human body parts. And he says, well, of course you knew I was doing this. I got checks that were written with UCLA on it. And my clients included Fortune 100 companies like Johnson & Johnson. This is just a few years back. He collaborated with Henry Reid. Henry Reid was the form, is the former director of the cadaver procurement uh, office for UCLA Medical School. These two collaborated together to sell the bodies and body parts that were being donated to the school, and they sold them to pharmaceutical companies and others, cosmetic companies who wanted the skin, et cetera. And when prosecutors have tried to figure out, well, what do we do with these cases? This is not a car being stolen. It's not a laptop being stolen. So these are the types of issues that demand our attention and demand that we think about how, in fact, we should think about the human body. Now, on one hand, if you follow the reasoning in more v. regions, well, no one owns the body. You know, individuals don't own the body, so who's missing anything? The family. You know, if UCLA isn't bothered by it, why should anybody else be? Families gave the bodies to, to UCLA. The body has no property interest, that no property interest connected with the family. Forget about it and go home. But there is something that's morally troubling about that for many of us. All right. Here's a Chinese woman advertising to sell her organs. I was just in Beijing a couple months ago. And that's actually not unusual. Part of our demand for organs in the United States has spilled over to China. And it is true that there are, that there are Chinese prisoners who are executed and doctors line up to then get their organs. And then those organs become available for people who need transplant. It's just the, the truth of it. It's the way that it is, right? Or uh, in parts of the former Soviet Union, right? Those are eyes that are in a jar, not to be too gruesome about it, because this is a mild photo of how some bodies are treated, right? This is a body, it may be difficult to see, but it's on a dirty floor. It's been gutted of its organs and some of its bones, and now those body parts are in the stream of commerce, right? And it's a stream of commerce that we don't know a whole lot about, about. And only recently has the FDA been involved in trying uh, to regulate it. All right. Michael Master Marino. He is a dentist who loses his license to practice in New York. Why? Because he spends part of his time uh, becoming, getting intoxicated and getting high off of uh, drugs in his office. And so he loses his license to practice when his secretary turns him in. But... Master Marino is smart, and what he realizes is that there's huge demand for human body part, and he knows this because he's a dentist and he uses human body part bone ground up and implanted in our teeth. So he starts his own business, uh, and what they do is he collaborates with funeral home directors. He pays each of them $1,000 for every body that he is given access to, and what he puts in the body are these plastic pipes exchanged for bones, right? And again, so we've got L.A. stuff happening. We've got, on the other end of the country, New York. And you have prosecutors in both instances trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this? We know that there's something that is wrong, something that's been violated, but how do we sort of pursue this domain, right? And I'll just fast forward us here so that we can have some time for talk, so we for, for Q and A. So, what does the Bill of Rights hold for us, right? When you think about our natural rights, liberty, property, 
freedom of religious affiliation, freedom of speech, free press, free assembly, free association. What in here provides some guidance for us in thinking about our status, our ownership in the body, how to protect ourselves, right? Did Henrietta Lacks have a reasonable expectation of privacy found in her body? It's a relevant and, and interesting question. With the non-consensual removal of human tissue, if it's done through a government agent, is that cruel and unusual? Chances are the person's probably under anesthesia of some type, right? So not necessarily painful per se. Is there any kind of purchase there? What about slavery? Do we get anything out of the 13th Amendment at all? Does the 13th Amendment help to ensconce some sort of property right in our body? What's very interesting in the discourse that involves whether or not there should be a market interest in the human body, scholars for years said, well, there shouldn't be because if there were, it would be just like slavery, and the people who would most be exploited would be poor African Americans. Now, I want, as I begin to wrap this up, to, to think about an anchoring moment in history in the U.S. that I think gives some insight um, to the question of ownership uh, in the human body. And Justice, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, I think, helps us to think this through in the case of Buck v. Bell. And Buck v. Bell is a case that involved a young woman who was from Virginia who had been raped by her uh, employer's nephew. She has a baby out of wedlock. And in Virginia, they're experimenting at that time in the 1920s with a eugenics law. And what they want to do is to sterilize people that are just like Carrie. And in fact, she becomes part of a test case, right? And her case goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the question before them is whether or not there can be, whether or not it would be unconstitutional, violate her constitutional rights, if she is non-consensually sterilized. And what Justice Holmes says is that the, beyond saying that the three generations of imbeciles are enough, that the very authority that gives the state the right to vaccinate its citizens gives the state enough of a right, a broad enough right, to sniff the fallopian tubes. And then he follows that with saying three generations of imbeciles are enough. And the case is never overturned, right? So then we can see in that domain the way in which the state can come and take some sort of ownership over our space and our body. So as I bring this to a close, we want to think about principles and values. What kinds of principles and values should be involved in medical research and human experimentation? or spaces that involve the exchange of human body part and flesh, right? What kind of value should we think about when it comes to ova and sperm donation? And it's a very, very timely type of a question. About hair for sale. Now, a lot of people snicker at this. Oh, what's the, what's the matter? Is he's just getting some hair for sale. Interestingly enough, the hair that ends up coming into the marketplace is actually the hair that is donated for religious reasons in India. And that hair is typically then stolen right after donation for religious reasons and is connected with, with individuals um, paying homage to their God, and it's about their spiritual, the sanctity of their body and, and sharing this with their God, and then it's quickly conscripted and then sold over to the United States, and we see it flying about at award shows, right? Human milk. Now, some students say, oh, yuck, human milk. But human milk is for sale now. You can get it on eBay and other places on the Internet right now, and it helps people, um, and, and people want human milk. Right. Now, we do have some anchoring uh, moments in history and rules that go along with that to help us think through um, why medical ethics are important. Right? The Nuremberg Code developed after the Nuremberg trial, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Declaration of Helsinki, all help to give us some guidance. Um, as to how we should think about uh, uh, preserving human dignity. Right. 
In bioethics, we say that the principles that should be upheld are autonomy, preserving or respecting the autonomy of individuals, that doctors should not engage in any kind of malfeasance, that whatever services are provided should provide some benefit to the patient, and that justice should be at the core of that relationship. And why do we think this? We think this because of what happened in Nazi Germany. On the left here, we have a war crimes investigation photo of the disfigured leg of a survival, survivor from, from Ravensbrück, Polish, she was a Polish uh, political prisoner, Helena Heger, and she was subjected to medical experiments uh, in 1942. The photograph was entered as evidence for the prosecution uh, at the medical trial in Nuremberg. The disfiguring scars resulted from incisions made by medical personnel that were purposefully infected with bacteria, dirt, and slivers of glass. And on the right is a young uh, boy, it's a Jewish child, who was forced to show his scar after uh, Nazi doctors removed his lymph nodes. Uh, the child was one of 20 Jewish children injected with tuberculosis germs as part of medical uh, medical experiment. All of the children were then later murdered on April 20th, uh, 1945. Um, and I share this because it anchors us in, our, in a historical moment. And what's very interesting is that you notice slides before uh, dealing with the Tuskegee experiment. So we have this, and we have the Nuremberg Code that develops after this. And then in the United States, while we know while we know what is appropriate in terms of human engagement with medical research and medical science, we still for 40 years continue an experimentation that is about hastening the death of African American men in the South with all that we knew. So it is important to revisit uh, these moments in history and I think to think about what our values happen to be. Now, before I close, um, here is a picture of a tombstone, and, and you might not see it too well in the back, but it says Henrietta Lacks here, um, and on it is inscribed, in loving memory of a phenomenal woman, wife, and mother who touched the lives of many. Here lies Henrietta Lacks, Hela. Um, her immortal cells will continue to help mankind forever. Eternal love, admiration from your family. Now, why do I include that here? Well, I include it because... This tombstone was just purchased about a year ago. For decades, Henrietta's family never received anything at all. Not a penny, not a dime, not free medical treatment, nothing from Johns Hopkins whatsoever. Even though as she was dying, there was the rush to capitalize and commercialize her cell line, the rush to make patents off of her cell line, the selling of that cell line all across the world, her cells went up in space missions, her cells were everywhere, right? And the family not, didn't receive anything for it, right? And some would say, and that's right, they never should have. But it brings to home any number of issues about exploitation, about human ownership in our bodies, and also about what guiding values and principles should govern this field generally. And I think that as a fundamental part of what we think about in terms of values and principles, we really must persevere. I don't think that we should give up at all. I think what this calls into question are some great questions for you here at this law school about how we should define the future of these technologies and how the law should engage with them. And also accountability. How do we ensure levels of accountability when we have the rush to patent and the rush to create, and there can be slippage sometimes where we overlook other people and their humanity. And how do we bring integrity and dignity into these processes? I'd finally like to conclude with just one point, and that is reimagining the trust relationship. I think it will be incumbent upon individuals to rethink how they engage with their doctors and how they engage with medical science generally. I think what we've always expected from individuals is trust absolutely given. 
But I think that as we look back over some of these slides and what's been happening in the larger medical sphere, perhaps people shouldn't surrender trust too quickly. Maybe trust is something that actually has to be earned. And with that, I'll conclude in time for us to have about 10 minutes of questions. All right, thank you. Now, if you do have any questions or comments, I just want to remind you that since we're recording, that you should use the microphone right there. And even if you don't have a question, but you have a comment or an observation about this, please feel free to share it. This is fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, one thing I've always wondered Typically, experiments that have been done over the years, maybe even still today, when they focused on those who were considered by society to be less than, whether they be Jewish or African American or prisoners or mentally unstable, how could they extrapolate from that, since they didn't consider them human, that the results they received were also beneficial to the rest of the population? I think that is, it's, it's a great question. It's a question that I think gets right at the heart of coercion. It's right at the heart of how we live in a kind of divided world and thinking about these issues. Your question brings to mind Marion Sims, and I talked with students last night about Dr. Sims. He's considered the father of gynecology. And he would rent slaves out, so he leased them from, local, from his local community in South Carolina. And as he wrote in his autobiography, in the middle of the night he would have an epiphany uh, about uh, a surgical, surgical technique that he could use. And he would rouse these women up in the middle of the night and perform a cesarean section. They weren't pregnant. No anesthesia provided at all. And he talks about this in his autobiography, right? You know, and what's interesting is how we read stories then and the importance of critical thinking. Because for decades, I mean, there are three statues of, of him. There's one across from the South Carolina Medical School. There's one in Central Park of him. I mean, he's, he's glorified, right? And for decades and decades, people would read his autobiography and say, Marion Sims was just brilliant and never bother to think about, really, are, are you reading what he said he did to these women? How he would wake them up in the middle of the night and begin cutting on them and that he would do it without anesthesia and that he'd say that they didn't really need anesthesia. They were strong enough to survive his surgery without it. And it does call into question then how we also benefit from that and, and how we reconcile how we benefit from some of these more heinous acts. I, too, uh, agree with you that it is a bit curious how, on one hand, it is so easy uh, or it has been so easy for some to dismiss the humanity of some people and yet build science off of them and build benefit off of what they've provided to us. Thanks. I just have one quick uh, follow-up. Have you ever utilized the film Never Let Me Go in any of your talks? You know, I wrote, I haven't utilized the film, but I have uh, written a review about Never Let Me Go and combined it with, uh, with Picot's uh, book as well. And so, or Picot's was the Never Let Me Go, and the other is Ishiguru's uh, book. And the book is about, uh, about organ donation. And so, yes, <laughs> I have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goodwin. I enjoyed Thank your you. talk. I did watch the, the Grammys last night, and I was struck by this, the two worlds in, in, with respect to voice box. And, of course, you have on the one hand the beautiful Adele, who swept the, the Grammys last night with her, with her song and the story about her doctor in England who had repaired her voice box. Yes. Yet at the same time, they were in the same hotel where Whitney Houston was losing her ability to sing. If you heard her over the last few years, her voice was going. And I wondered, and of course at the end there she, she died, right there in that hotel. And so the, it made me think about the contrast of why didn't she have the same kind of medical care 
or why did she do the things she did to her own body? You know, and, and just the differences in the voice. But maybe this is a comment, not a question, so much as that dichotomy or the irony of the two situations. Right. Well, it is very interesting. Um, the, it is interesting uh, to, to see, given this year, Amy, or last year, Amy Winehouse, another uh, brilliant musician as well, who succumbs to drug tragedy and whatnot. We don't know what killed Whitney Houston, but we do know that there was a history of, of drug use and, and abuse. Um, and interestingly enough, not necessarily exploitation at all by doctors, but exploitation possibly by industry, right? And how that industry takes its own toll on the body as well. And then how consumers consume that as well. How we are in our own ways complicit in some of these things, knowingly or not. Hi, uh, Hi, Professor Goodwin. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. We've read a couple of your papers in our genetic property class. Um, in you have a brilliant professor teaching that <laughs> class. <laughs> well, it, he learned from the best. Um, my question is about, um, I believe in several of your papers you urge a commodification of certain, or, or possibly a limited commodification of human organs. Um, my question is about, uh, based on maybe your travels or your research, uh, what sort of social stigma might be attached uh, if it were uh, more legal or at least more mm -hmm. available? For example, uh, if kidney donations for money were illegal here, would there, do you believe, be any social stigma with people who had donated kidneys? That's an excellent question. So let me start off by saying there are those who believe that if there were any incentives to be associated with human organs, that it would basically create a situ situation of crowding out. And by crowding out, what that means is that they believe that individuals who currently donate altruistically would no longer donate, right? So that, you, the, so that the system itself would become spoiled by that. Now, one way of thinking about that is to think about what altruism actually is in our system and to interrogate that, which I do in my work, which is to say that there are varying grades and shades of altruism. We tend to think of altruism itself as just something that's a plain good that no one gets anything off of. But, of course, there is some benefit that comes from doing things altruistically, a feel good. And at other times, altruism is actually premised on pressure and guilt and family coercion. Not every family organ donation is one that was just full and voluntary. In fact, the first written case on the topic, the first written opinion on the topic is in Strunk v. Strunk. It's a Kentucky case that involves a young man who uh, has the capacity of a six-year-old, though he's 26, and he's at a mental, um, an institution for the mentally incapable in Kentucky. And his 27-year-old brother needs a kidney, and the mother wants the 26-year-old to give the kidney. The brother wants the 26-year-old to give the kidney, and the court in a split decision says, give him the kidney because, after all, he has social value. He's in college, he's married, and he's doing good things. Why should we worry, essentially, about the one who's 26 years old? So, stigma, it's interesting. In the kidney field, you know, I'm not sure. There have been studies, gone, there have been studies done um, that demonstrate that Americans more and more are interested in incentives or be, would be willing to donate if, in fact, they were to receive some form of an incentive. I'm not sure that the concerns that animated this field 20 years ago are the same today, given that so many people are connected with a person who's on dialysis or who has needed a kidney. And that has been a change. The other has been a change of mindset. Forty years ago, we were satisfied with people dying. If someone drank heavily and needed an organ, we knew uncle, you know, or they were just dying. They were dying. You know, 40 years ago, you're dying because you blew your, your liver. Today, it's, well, you blew your liver, but guess what? We can try to get you on a wait list to get another one. So we've had a social and cultural change in terms of how we think about supply and demand and what we need in the body. So I'm not sure that stigma would follow with organs. There could be some, but I'm, I'm not sure. But in other parts of the world, yes, it's, there's a lot of stigma that's associated. The guys with the big scars, 
In their community, it's okay. Outside of their community, no, that's frowned upon. But equally, in India, there are whole communities of women who now carry children for Americans. That's also stigmatized, but they make money off it, so they're trade-offs. And in those communities, you have full cohorts of just people who carry babies. And they are paid for nine months. They're given training and other kind of support. And their, what their role is just a kind of new version of colonialism. You know, carry the baby and then give it back to the folks or give it to the people in the U.S. It's a great question. I guess we have time for one more. How you doing, Dr. Goodwin? Uh, very interesting talk, and uh, it was great listening to you yesterday. Um, my question sort of piggybacks on his. Um, imagine that the National Organ Act was repealed and uh, kidney donation, for example, was legalized. What sort of framework would you imagine that the government or private entities or uh, charitable organizations would be, how would that, what's the, what would you imagine, what would well, be the best way for that to Yes, work? well, I remember quite astutely, you, you knew yesterday that it's in Iran where uh, it's the only place where uh, organ compensation is, is, is actually legal. Though we do have different tax regimes here that, that help families out that are interested in, in donation. What I've articulated in some of my work is that we should allow states to experiment because in different states, they'll be motivated differently. Demand will be different. Uh, how, um, how those states uh, frame their politics will happen to be different. Um, so I have proposed that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services allow for there to be a waiver for, for states to waive out of the National Organ Transplant Act. Uh, those waivers would have to be approved by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And with the, uh, when, you when you achieve getting a waiver through HHS, uh, you have to demonstrate that you what you're planning to do is going to be much more successful and at lower cost than what is currently taking place. So in the U.S. right now, we spend um, on average sixty to $90,000 a year uh, paying for people's dialysis. It's one of the one things that we do for free for people, right? Uh, and we have about a half million people on dialysis in this country. That's a whole lot of money, right? Uh, and you might imagine a scenario where if we incentivize people to donate an organ by providing uh, some form of a $20,000 gift, $25,000 gift, what have you, that provides an organ, that takes away that every year of sixty to ninety thousand dollars a year that we're paying for people to be on dialysis and dialysis is, is no fun time it doesn't cure you of the underlying disease at all you're tethered to a dialysis machine uh... several times a week for several hours at a time that significantly reduces an individual's quality of life so i've i've uh, been quite courageous in being public about suggesting that we might want to, we should think about, think this through differently. And one point that I would add to that, when we think about altruism, currently with our organ transplant process, we make it difficult for some people to be altruistic. And, and let me explain why. Let's say that we have friends that work at a factory together. And one of the friends is uh, dying uh, from uh, renal failure. The other friend wants to give the organ. Wants to do it, wants to do it. But that friend does that five weeks off from work. The job isn't guaranteed. There are no legal protections unless you're a federal worker that you can keep a job, that the job will be there if you give an organ. There's none. So no guarantee of the job when you get back. That salary, five weeks worth of salary, gone. Now in that time there's a mortgage to pay or there's rent to pay. There are some kids who need some lunch money. There's an electric bill. There's a gas bill. And you can see where I'm going from here. So that you might have, practically speaking, individuals who really want to rise up to the challenge and be altruistic, but they just can't afford to do it. And currently, we have not designed a system that allows for individuals to be generous and altruistic in that way without also losing in the process. And I think that's what we actually want to pay attention to. Thank you all so very much. I really do appreciate your time and attention today.
Wonderful. Thank you. It's really wonderful. I think you just pitched it just right. Thank you.